So, so uh, thank you very much for com coming and showing up. So the topic of genius and, and, and in particular maybe sort of understanding creative leaps is a very slippery topic and it's sort of very difficult to say something concrete about. I'm a quantum physicist and that makes it maybe even more difficult to talk about genius and creativity. Um, but very often you hear words like, so, so if you have something which is really difficult uh, then, or something which may not be so difficult, then you'll say, well, at least it's not quantum physics or atomic physics or rocket science, right? So maybe I could use this occasion to talk about some of the big stars in our field, which is sort of Albert Einstein or Niels Bohr and how they made leaps of creativity in order to transform the field. Or, or maybe I could even talk about my own personal journey of becoming a professor in quantum physics and, and, and what that required. And just to, to sort of uh, eliminate that possibility completely of, of uh, anything interesting in my personal journey, I want to tell a sort of personal story uh, first. So my son, he loves to watch a, a television show which is called uh, Big Nerd, Store Nerd. And they build lots of things and in one of the shows they built an electromagnet. So a big electromagnet that could lift up people. And so he came to me and he said, Dad, we have to build one of these electromagnets. And so I said, okay, let's try it. And I know that in order to build an electromagnet, you need a nail and then you need a wire. So I took a, a nail, which is iron, and then I stripped some wire around it and then I put it into the wall plug and the whole house got dark because I blew a fuse, because of course you're not supposed to do that, because you're supposed to have a load on things. So I, I stuck in the, the lamp here and the lamp was glowing and, and the, there was light in the house, but the electromagnet wasn't working. And I didn't really know why the electromagnet wasn't working. So the next day, my son was sick and I took him to my father-in-law to be, to be taken care of. And then he, um, I told him the story. So he's a retired physici physics teacher in, in, in primary school. Told him the story and he started laughing at me. So why did he laugh at me? He laughed at me because I put it into the wall plug, which is, has an alternating current, which means I'm creating a North Pole here, a North Pole here, North Pole here, North Pole here, which means that it doesn't work as, a, as an electromagnet. So my point of the story is not, well, not entirely to say that I'm a poor experimental physicist, but also to say that when you take research, if you take something which is really, really complicated, then it requires lots and lots of knowledge and competences. And, and putting all of that together can be a very demanding thing. So, so I'll call it micro-competences. And what we're trying to study is not the genius of individual scientists or individual uh, superstars, but the genius in all of us in which, just like my father-in-law, he had these micro-competences. And what we could do if we found ways of tapping into these micro-competences. This field is called citizen science. So what we try to do is we try to create games that taps into the creative potential of the lay people in order to let them solve complex challenges. So the, if you follow the news over the last couple of years, you know that there's been an expansion, an explosion of artificial intelligence results that have moved into various different domains. So it feels as if sort of the whole uh, creativity and domain of, of, of the human species is under attack. And this has been formalized a little bit by a, ri a guy called uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist, and he has sort of taken all of the advances in human species and plotted them in a diagram, and then it looks sort of, with the years here, it looks as a singularity. So some point in the near future, we will see advances that are so fast that the human mind cannot comprehend it. In other words, if you take computational power, which is available, plotted as a function of the years, we will, according to his predictions, in the year 2045, reach a point in which artificial intelligence scale has surpassed human capabilities of reasoning. And at that point, maybe the human race is not extinct, but maybe obsolete. So, so I'll give you just a two minute rundown on, on sort of the development from my perspective of artificial intelligence and the interlink between human and artificial intelligence. In the 90s, many people considered the most clever or intelligent person in the world to be the chess champion, Garry Kasparov, because he could do sort of this very, very complicated game of chess. But then a computer is, is, is developed that beats him. And then suddenly we say, actually chess is not that much about human creativity and intelligence because it's just sort of a board. There are possibilities. Maybe there are a lot of them and then just have to keep them in your mind. And that's exactly what computers are good at, right? So what humans are very good at is taking an image and recognizing it and knowing what that pattern is. Except if you take millions of images on the internet, couple it with modern uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, then 
you get algorithms that can now take a picture like this and say, this is a lamppost, this is a guy, this is a truck, and this is a skateboard. So then we say, labeling things, that's actually something any algorithm can do, but what is really difficult is to look at a picture and formulate a sentence about the context of what is happening there. Right? That is true human intelligence. Except that if you take this and then couple machine learning, computer vision, and language recognition into a neural network, then you can have a picture like this one here, which is a cat lying on a bed with a laptop, and then what comes out of the neural network is this sentence which makes sense. But then, okay, making sentences which make sense is what any algorithm can do if you feed it with the right input. What is truly human intelligence is to be able to look at facial expressions. So I look around the crowd here, and if I were to tell a joke, then I would recognize whether you actually thought it was funny or you, you were just polite. That would be human intelligence. Except if you couple it with three million face videos on the internet and deep learning, then you get an uh, app like this one here from the company uh, from MIT, which can now look at your facial expression and give you indicators of innermost feelings like joy, surprise, and anger. So that means step by step, we are really seeing the computer algorithms taking over what we believe to be the domain of not just sort of intelligence, but also, let's say, processing and, and creativity. So in the, game of, in, in the role of computer games, uh, one illustration of this was, was made by Google DeepMind in 2014, in which they took a number of old 80s, old school Atari games, one of them being Breakout. So there's a Breakout game here, which is you have a paddle here, you have a ball, and then the task is to remove all of these. So feed that into a reinforcement learning algorithm, and then after a very, very short time, it finds out that you have to dig a hole right here, and then it just goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it solves the problem. So this plot here, which you cannot read, is 35 different games, and it shows the state of human intelligence versus uh, artificial intelligence. Because above this line, like 20 of them, the computer was better at playing. And everything below the line, we humans are still best at. So this shows the unique position in time that we are in right now, where 10, 20 years ago, we were the dominant species intellectually on Earth, and maybe when we move this line further and further down, 10 or 20 years from now, that may no longer be the case. So that is sort of the onslaught of artificial intelligence. Is that true human scale artificial intelligence? More and more researchers, sort of artificial intelligence researchers, when they are honest, maybe behind closed doors, and some of them behind open doors, admit, like Gary Marcus here, that the task of making true human scale intelligence is daunting. And so he's saying, He's questioning whether this paradigm of big data and big data processing will really take us towards really human-scale intelligence. And what he says is, we need to learn and teach the algorithms to learn much more from less data rather than from big data. And that is the distinctly human skills that we have. And this is where creativity genius comes into place because we need to study how we humans solve prob problems, how we make creative leaps of faith. So I'll give you three different examples of what I would call the magic of the human mind. One of them is from physics, and that is how do we catch a ball? So as a physicist, I would say we catch a ball by taking the sort of uh, the parabola that we know that it will have according to gravity. Then we take wind conditions, uh, so we take wind resistance into account, which is sort of slightly complicated, depends on the velocity. And then we take wind conditions into account, which is unsimulatable because we don't know, which means Basically, as a physicist, I would say we'd never be able to write an algorithm that could, write, that could catch the ball. And yet, we always catch the ball. How do we do it? Psychologists have tried to find out how we do it, and it actually turns out that the way we humans catch a ball is not by solving all of these complex mm -hmm. equations, but by moving ourselves such as to keep the angle to the ball constant. If you keep the angle to the ball constant, you will catch the ball. So try it next time. You'll probably not catch the ball because you are distracted by this, but that's actually how we humans solve these problems. And that's an example of what is called a heuristics. So you have a very, very complicated problem, but we humans have some ability to ignore the fact that there are endless possibilities and then just do something. And very often the something that we do actually turns out to be very useful. I have another example which is related to the distinctly human ability that we have which makes us distinct from computer algorithms, that is, we have a very sophisticated algorithm for filtering 
information. We call it forgetting things. So we humans have a limited capacity of, of storing things, and that actually becomes very powerful. An illustration of that was a, there was a German uh, professor in psychology who made a, 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 a questionnaire in which he took college students from the US and then German university students, and then he took pairs of two American cities and asked them which one is larger. So he took two American cities and then asked which one is larger. Which team was better, the Germans or the Americans? The Germans. So why were the Germans better at recognizing American cities than the Americans were? He didn't know, so he started asking the German students what their algorithm was. How did you know all of these answers? And in the end they said, I don't know. I, I just picked whichever one I had heard of, or whichever one I had heard of the most. Right? So that's an illustration that sometimes knowing everything and being able to store everything is not the best in order to reach the right conclusions. Whereas the Americans sort of had heard about everything, so it's made much, much harder for them to distinguish between these. And then I have the last example, which is my favorite example. So this is a set of connected uh, gears. And, and the idea is, if this one turns clockwise, how does the last one turn? Clockwise or anti-clockwise? So it was a game, children were playing it while they were being monitored by the psychologist. And what the children did was, they sort of started out tracing it out with their finger and then they found out that the last one was turning clockwise. But at some point during that gameplay, they found out a different way of solving it. What was the different way of solving it? You calculate whether there's an even or an odd number of wheels and then you know whether it turns clockwise or counter counterclockwise, right? Not so surprising. But what was surprising was in the instant that they discovered this, their eyes did like this. So they had an outwards reaction to the inward process of generating a new idea. If you don't think that is cool, uh, I'm then, uh, then I'm amazed. But it was even cooler because they made a new game. And they made a new game in which at some point during the gameplay, a star appeared here and a star there and a star there and a star there. And then their eyes did like this, like this, like this, like this. And then they discovered the algorithm. Again, now, if you don't think that is cool, then I will just walk home because <laughs> that means that we can actually start to influence the conditions of creativity, innovation, discovering new ideas. It's not some inwards process, it's much, much more complicated. The human mind is much, much more complicated than that. The question is, how can we tap into that? How can we understand that? How can we use that knowledge as a resource? Being a physicist, I try to, to make things a little bit less, more tangible, more concrete, trying to sort of say something less fluffy about it. So when I talk about creativity, in intuition, what I'm actually talking about is search within a landscape like this. So you can imagine any problem that you might have, let's say that you are a company and you are given with the choice of whether to hiring uh, creative artists here or physicists here, and then for every pair that you, so, so let's say 10 of, 10 of these and five of these, you calculate the profit that you would get. So it's sort of a, a thought experiment, right? So, but then you can see that given all of these control variables here, you have something, a landscape that emerges here, and your task now, either as a corporate corporation, as a scientist, or as a creative artist, is to figure out how to find the top in this landscape. Usually it's not just two parameters you have, maybe it's 10 or 1,000 or trillions of parameters, which means that this landscape may be very hard to imagine, but think about it, every time you have a task to solve, you can do one of two things. You can take the task, the, the solution that you already have at hand, and you could sort of iteratively refine it. What does that mean? That means being somewhere in the landscape and climbing to the local highest mountain here. Or you could take that solution and throw it away and do something completely differently. That would be sort of the leap of faith or the leap of creativity in which you leap from here to somewhere else. That's what computer algorithms also do. And when they have to scan the whole landscape, that very, very quickly becomes uncomputable. What we humans sometimes do when we have these constructive leaps of faith or leaps of creativity is that we start somewhere and we take a leap in the right direction into the unknown. We have no idea what is here, but somehow through our intuition, the probability that the step that we take is actually higher that it's in a good direction and in a bad direction. Why is that? That's something we need to understand. If we understand that, then maybe we can also understand more about what creativity is, what it is, how we, how we make these choices. So, two minutes about quantum physics because uh, because now I got you in the room. 
So what I'm trying to do is, in my experiment, uh, build something called a quantum computer. It's, I won't go into detail with what it is, but it's just, if we develop it, it's more powerful than all the computers in the world combined, which means that every big university and corporation in the world, Stanford, Yale, Google, IBM, and Aarhus, are trying to build one of these computers. So what can we do with that computational power? We can access some of these global challenges. We can create energy, cons we can create a fertilizer for the growing population, sustainable green energy, and maybe even CO2 absorbing organic batteries that will fight global warming. So uh, an experiment like this looks like this. It's in the basement in, in, in Aarhus. And uh, the idea is you have several of these sort of lasers and some mirrors, and the idea is to collect all of those, shine them onto an atoms, and then cool them from room temperature all the way down to near zero temperature. And at this near zero temperature, we can actually create what is sort of like an egg tray container, and we can place one atom in each of these holes. And then we can create what is called a quantum computer based on that. The problem is that in order to create a quantum computer, we need to be able to pick up an atom and move it very quickly around. And that's actually very similar to picking up a glass of water and running with it and having no sloshing in the end. That turns out to be a very complicated mathematical problem. So instead, we turn to what is called citizen science. So I personally have two citizen science design philosophies, or at least I had. And one of them was, because we have such an epic mission, crowds will be happy to help us. And then second of all, hopefully, this is more hope, I think that people, given the right sort of conditions, will also be willing to spend their time playing games that are sort of slightly less uh, uh, refined than the Subway Surfers game, for instance. So otherwise, we would never be able to do it. So it was a formidable a task for me as a n not, not game developer and a physicist to create this game. So instead, what I did was I created, instead of creating the game, using those two design principles, I created an interface. An interface in which people, it looks a little bit nerdy, and that's because I have no artistic skills. So, so what, what I did was I created this interface in which people could try out all different levels. They could rate them, and they could reshuffle them, and then they would create the game for me. Then I went on national radio, and I enlisted 100 people to be my beta testers. And they had to download a 300 megabyte uh, uh, environment. And of the 100, 80, uh, eight of them managed to download this, and of the eight, 100% of them were too confused by the interface to give me any contribution. So again, this is an example of me being not a genius uh, at, at solving the things that I'm doing, right? So, so those design principles, they actually failed. What we have to do, if we want the crowd to help us, is do 99% of the work, and then once the interface is like this, then it becomes much more clear what they could do to help us, and then they will be happy to help. So in order to do that, I made one of the very difficult choices. I, I did hired an, a, 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 a professional game developer with my hard-earned uh, postdoc and PhD money. And once I had one game developer, I also needed a web developer. And once you have a web developer, you also need a graphic artist. And once you have a graphic artist, you also need a design director. And then you also need a development uh, management. And then, then the team grows. But the team grows, and the pro the what we get from that is that now we can create a universe, scienceathome.org, which not only has games, but also has the feel of a uh, an environment in which people can, in fact, contribute. So this is how a current version of the game looks like. Here you have the liquid-like substance, which is the atom. And now you control the atom in this sort of container, and your task is to get it over there with as quickly as possible, with as little sloshing as possible. The mathematically very difficult problem, but for humans, this just seems as if they are late for work and running with their cup of coffee and not trying to spill, right? So there is a lot of intuition from that. And in particular, it also is very related to the spring, to the pendulum, and to a child on a swing. So we are hoping to be able to tap into creativity, the, you know, uh, the, the, the experience of humans in this way. Then we can take number one on the high score. We can take the mouse movements or finger movements of the player and convert that into electrical signals. And then I have the solutions for moving my atoms in the lab. That's the dream. And what we did was we enlisted tens and hundreds of thousands of people to play it. They showed that the humans were actually better at playing this than, than the computers were. And, and in Los Angeles Times, for instance, said, take that AI, video gamers solve quantum physics mystery using human intuition. So that means we can really tap into human intuition. There is something that we can exploit. Again, see this landscape? What was happening was we had a thousand dimensional landscape. No one can imagine a thousand dimensional landscape. But a, a poor man's representation of this is this here. There's a lot of regions where there's nothing. 
Then there's something where there are intermediately good solutions, and then there's a small region here where there are good solutions. And by some magic coincidence or, uh, or non-magic, then the players actually searched only in this green region, which means the human skills is ignoring the fact that we can never search everything and then just go with your intuition. And it turns out to be matched so that this gave us a good inspiration. I think this is a more general concept that we can do with games because in games this allows us to change the rules of the universe or the laws of physics. And we come then as players and then we have to get used to these new rules. So the game of Portal is one example in which you are walking around in a 3D world and then you are supposed to do something which is physically impossible like grab a, a, a bag which is beyond your reach but then you have two superpowers. One is you can place an entry portal on the side and an exit portal for instance in the roof and then you fall out there, you grab the ball, uh, the bag and then you solve this puzzle. So the example of this is that in a very very short time we can turn people from having no intuition on particular sets of rules like, like portals or quantum physics and then mixing their everyday intuition with that particular quantum spice and then they form what we would call quantum intuition which is exactly what is needed in order to solve these problems. Quantum intuition is built in into none of the current state-of-the-art algorithms and that's what we're trying to do. So what we're trying to do is take quantum physics problems or natural science problems in general and then treat them as a cognitive or social science test topic in which we study the people who solve these problems. Trying to learn what are the general features of this and once we learn the general, understand the general features of that first of all we learn more about us as humans and about how we are creative or innovative but second of all we can also hope to be able to encode that into how novel uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence algorithms should work. So I'll give you two examples of this. One example is a game called Quantum Minds, which is also available on scienceathome.org, where you can uh, take, see that the interface is sort of more or less the same as it was before. It's this sloshing liquid, but now the cognitive scientists got to decide the rules, which means they said you have to solve the problem not once, but three times in a row. And if you solve the problem three times in a row, then we say that you learned this task. It's not luck or coincidence, you actually learned it. So what we do is now, so here's a, a busy slide of a subset of the players who played it and each of this here is a single player. Here is the number of times they played and here's their score in that particular realization. The green are the people who managed to learn it and the black are the people who didn't. So what we're trying to do now is take all of that data and then split it into the first half in which none of the players have learned this process so far. So they don't know how to solve it, but still some of them will end up being green and some of them will end up being black. The question is, can we predict based on their performance or behavior from the early st stages whether they will succeed in the end? In that sense, based on not actually knowing and not having discovered that, can we discover the microscopic signs of fruitful learning rather than unfruitful learning? So that means we can be able to predict that, we can get the predictors of that and then we'll be able to put that into algorithms to make algorithms learn more efficiently, make these creative jumps. So the question here is how do you solve a complex challenge? How do you balance taking a solution and refining it with sometimes sort of skipping away to the unknown and having that right balance? Of course this is a very daunting task because many of you, if you are creative, will say that's all very good because that's a one test topic and it doesn't really say anything about creativity in general or innovation in general, uh, which is true. Uh, and, and, and you will also say that every person who does creativity or, 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 or innovative tasks are also different, which is also true. But what we're trying to do is actually something much more fundamental. We're trying, in some sense, to find an equation, an underlying equation of innovation, which is general, which applies to any of these different tasks. So what do we need to do for that? We need to be able to subdivide all of the different types of creativity that exist in the world. Which means we have people who have one personality trait and another personality trait and then we need to know for a particular type set of tasks how do you match those types of characteristics, player characteristics or personality characteristics. So of course what we could do is we could have problem solving and then we could ask millions of people to fill in questionnaires and find their psychological profile. If we get their psychological profile and match it to their innovative uh, potential, then we could sort of start to see patterns. That's not so scalable. So what we did instead was we developed this game here. So this is a prototype which is currently being tested. 
in which you're supposed to build a tower that reaches all the way up here as quickly as possible and it will become unstable at some point and then from five minutes of gameplay here we can then extract game features like the time between the clicks and the uniqueness of the shake and the stability of that and based on that we are working on showing that you can actually reconstruct constructs like risk aversion, resiliency, attention to detail, creativity uh, and something called Big Five. Which means if we can get millions of people to play games, in particular play this game, then we can get cognitive profiles of people and then we can let them play other games, more complicated games, and then we can start to subdivide people into these tasks, into these, into these let's say, personality types and start to unravel the very, let's say, personality-specific characteristics of innovation. So that's the task that we sort of are, are, are trying to do. In the end, I just want to say, I'm a quantum physicist, so of course I cannot do that alone. So we need psychologists and, 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 and cognitive scientists and first people from corporate innovation, didactics and machine learning. And what we're trying to do is combine all these people and the knowledge of all these people in order to attack these, let's say, grander scales. And of course, then we need, as I did talked about before, a huge sort of list of, of people on the floor who are really doing the development work. Uh, in particular, now you can't see it here, but Jonathan is sitting there. You should all send thanks to Jonathan because he, he took all of my slides, which are very, very messy and not very artistic, and, and turned them into something which is much, much nicer. If something is not artistically perfect, then it's because I insisted on keeping it the way it was, or if it's because I changed it in the last second. But you will see that, uh, so this is what we can get when we sort of combine all these different people, and then of course we also need some funding for that. So. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>